welcome to the panel about it's where we talk about the art market in general and of course we're going to mention the rise of the digital art market we're going to touch a little bit upon that so i want to introduce our guest today christine Guron, founder and ceo of PayX, mila askarova the owner of Gazelli Art House in London and Christoph Spanier, associate professor at HSC. I think, uh, Christine, I'm going to put you on the spot right away. You were sort of the last one to come in and in our uh, panel today. No, but it was interesting because obviously, Christine, you 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 research well, part of the things that you do at Payax is obviously you look at the market and you you follow, you know, the evolution of the market. And um, I was reading in the art market report that the market in 2020 could have fell by 22%. So I was wondering actually, so if you, if you look at the number, it was actually a big D, but I'm hopefully within this panel, we'll also talk about the positives that came out from sort of last year. And we will sort of share what we think are the positive to take forward. But this is obviously an open question for everyone, but I'll start with Christine. So how would you define the health of the market in 2020? If you had to kind of look at it and say, okay, you know, perspective of sort of past years, for example, of other dips that we've experienced in, in the art industry. Well, I think, I mean, it, it is true. If you, uh, if you take the market at the end of 2019 and you, then take a snapshot at that time, and then you take another snapshot at the end of 2020, you would see that there's been a decrease, but it's not dramatic. But what's been fascinating in, uh, in 2020, and I think very, very challenging for everybody in the market, is that in the meantime, you know, the whole period from March 2020 until December 2020, and even after that, has been extremely volatile and extremely different from anything we knew before. So I would say that 2020 will definitely stay in memory as a very, very challenging time when many of the things we knew in the art market were completely challenged. The market would put upside down, nothing, uh, nothing that we knew before was holding anymore. And now when we look back, especially at the end of this month, we're actually, you know, we're actually very, getting very close to where we were at the end of May 19. So I think the market has rebounded, like we, a lot of markets following the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. But this period is, is really, really interesting because there's been so much has happened. And, and I think it, it also has shown that there are many, many new opportunities for the market. You obviously, when you, when you talk about the market, I think it, it's worth, for those who don't know, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that you focus mostly on secondary market and, and auction houses. Well, absolutely. I mean, we everything I'm saying is only related also to public auction. So yeah. we, we only uh, track what we have data for. And as you know, only the, the public market uh, uh, provides some uh, transparent and, and reliable data. So uh, yeah, I am definitely not talking for the, the primary side, I mean, the primary market, the, the private size of the, of the market, where unfortunately, we, we do not have any data on. So, but the public market is always interesting because, I mean, number one, that's the only place you can really do analysis. And number two, uh, the, the, the public market, especially for uh, Sotheby's, Christie's and Phillips, which are the auction houses we, we track, uh, are definitely the leader of the market. So whatever happens there is always interesting and meaningful for the rest of the market. I think um, I wanna maybe talk a little bit later on, you know, how, you know, the auction houses had to quickly sort of adapt also to the uh, changing environment. But perhaps, Mila, from a point of view of a, an art gallery, you know, what were the, the challenges for a gallery to continue to actually maintain a, a market and, and sales and continue the relationship with, with collectors? So for us, I think it was um, mainly, well, for us, I guess, and for many other kind of dealers, galleries, it was exposure to new collector base. Having said that, last year, actually, ironically, was our best year yet in our kind of 10th year. This year is our 10th year anniversary in, in London, and it's been 
and and there's been a lot of kind of analysis and inter, you know internal discussions that we've had as to what what has be, what has happened in a way aside from obvious factors as online kind of presence and 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 being in touch with with our existing client base and I think mainly it was kind of a it it was our I guess eagerness of 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 having a very um, packed online program, which comprised of um, online shows and online talks, and we've done we every single week we'd be doing something, whether it was Instagram lives or whatever the content was. It was kind of we try to keep as active as possible, just to in a way be on the minds of our existing followers. But I think the main challenge throughout the year has been how do we expand on the existing followers or existing collector base. And but going back to kind of the reason I think why it's been you know our, our kind of best year yet, we've had a, a, a great kind of historical show that we put on in January just before we closed or a couple of months before uh, London went into lockdown. And through that show, we had we we met quite a few physically, met a few uh, real kind of. Um, passionate collectors of specific artists that were part of that show so throughout the year it was really about secondary market sourcing of specific artists that these are that these collectors were were after rather than going back to what you were saying just now primary secondary market rather than trying to place kind of artists from our, our program on, on a primary market basis it was very much to do with kind of secondary sourcing which which we found has been helping the kind of cash flow, kind of our, our, our you know, balance balance sheets and all the rest of it. Um, but it has been challenging. On the other hand, again, silver lining for us has been the time that I think everyone had to really get into building a really an existing relationship, you know, really kind of get down to show me your collection through FaceTime, see, let's, you know, show me, or whether it was studio visits that we've been doing with artists. So it's been kind of one-on-one -on -one in-depth relationship building in a way that, that everyone seemed to have time for, which, which obviously wasn't the case before. Um, so it was, it was, yeah, definitely obviously a lot of challenges, but on the other hand, it seemed, it seemed to have, um, had some kind of um, kind of yeah, a, a, a silver lining for sure. Sorry, I was a bit. <clears throat> I suddenly <clears throat> was coughing. <laughs> it was just, it always worries people, but <clears throat> no, it's uh, it's all good. It was just uh, the talking. So, I wonder, um, and maybe I don't know, Christoph, what you think. For me, in a way. Um, the challenges of last year and what I've also experienced, I was lucky enough to go into a little bit of the, of the new media art kind of world to tap into that before it exploded. And now I'm sort of back in what we say it's the more sort of traditional art market, but I don't even know if that's true. I think now all the boundaries are blending, but you know, Perhaps before uh, 2020, so in 2015, so pre-pandemic era, it felt that the market was maybe a little bit stagnant. And I was wondering actually if you also feel that last year has really changed the approach of collectors to, to art, to investing. And if indeed you, you have noticed that, when also Christoph in research, do you think we will see perhaps and an effects on, you know, kind of the, the art industry overall. That's a lot of questions in one, huh? Yes. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> you can decide to pick. Okay. So, so okay. So I think in terms of the past year, I think um, if you ask, like, has it been the health, or what is the health of the market? I think in that sense, at least for the auction market, I think it's pretty good in the sense that this has been a year in which finally the auction houses did some things that were innovative and new, and then you had the NFTs, and I mean. You've never seen so much uh, nice and new things coming out of auction houses in a really long time. I think it's also important to keep in mind that the shock that um, has affected the art market has affected every industry around the world. So I think the art market was maybe better placed, but also dealt with it better, or the art industry dealt with it better than, than or could deal with it better than many other industries. So I think in that sense, I think that the market and, and I'm talking mainly about the secondary auction market here because that's where, where, where I know most about. Yeah. Um, 
I think they're, they're definitely in a good, good shape now and a good position to, to, to tackle uh, the future. Um, I think it is true that, of course, um, you see new collectors coming with the new ways of selling art. You have seen new people coming in at the auction houses. So I think it has really given the shot of um, energy uh, that maybe the auction market could use. Um, now, that also means, I think uh, maybe we can we'll talk about this later when we talk about NFTs, but I, I think that also means that there's a lot of question marks, right? So, I mean, these new collect or the people that started buying this year or the past year, will they, will they stick around? Um, I mean, are these really art collectors or are these investors, speculators, crypto enthusiasts? Right. So I think there's a lot of questions about sort of the stability or the durability of some of the, the new buyer base. Um, but I think if you'd ask me, like, is the market healthy? And, and, and I would say, yes, I mean, uh, at least in the auction market, um, there's lots of things going on. And um, I mean, this is not a situation like we've had a few times in the past, in the 80s or the early 90s, where art collectors were massively withdrawing because they were afraid of being in the art market. Right. I think the pandemic indeed led to our trading becoming more complicated at some point. But I think the auction has have dealt with that. And yeah. at the end of the day, we may have more people considering to buy at auction today than two years ago, rather than less. Yes, I think I think you, you I think you're right. This is uh, also what I've noticed. And that's the big difference. I don't know if Christine, you also agree that. Um, I worked through the crisis of 2008, 2009, and it did feel this time around very different in the sense that collectors were still there and sort of available. It was just, we had to find a, a different way of obviously, you know, as, uh, as Mila said, continuing the relationship. And it was obviously a more challenging uh, way of, of selling because you couldn't, you know, invite people in the gallery or uh, have live auctions like we used to. But the collector base, or the traditional collector base, uh, had not gone away. And I think, yes, for me, that also is, I think, the, 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 the biggest difference. Now then, I don't know if, you know, what you think, you obviously, I think your gallery was a pioneer. And I remember I was working in London in 2015 and 16, and it was still very few talks about digital arts and new sort of introduced or you you decided to have a part of the gallery focus on virtual reality when again it was still a little bit in early days and very sort of unknown whereas last year you were sort of out if you didn't know anything about new media arts and all the technologies virtual reality mental reality of course blockchain and you know, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. So in your point of view, what is, what did actually the pandemic era helped that, but also what is the difference between when you started or when you introduced and supported artists working in virtual reality versus now and what you were you're seeing in, in the market? Yeah, so um, we had uh, last year in September was our 50th anniversary of hosting these group shows of artists working solely in VR. Um, and over the five years, we've kind of experimented with the ways to showcase this work, but the, the, the main kind of bottom line point of these exhibitions, point of this kind of digital arm of the gallery has always been to grow to create or expand on the existing on a, on a very small market for VR works but it was there was always kind of that commercial um, angle to to these shows um, so in interestingly enough as the 50th anniversary um, September last year it was in between the whatever it was lockdown two and three or one and two whatever whatever the numbers but um, despite the restrictions we've had over the month of the show, just under a thousand people come in who were, by our standards, it's a pretty, it, it's quite a high number. And we've we've dealt with, we've had all kinds of um, things in place that would um, actually uh, clean basically the, the, the headsets in between each use, et cetera. So we, we had to incorporate new um, elements to the experience itself that people would have. Despite all of that, um, I think despite COVID generally over the past 
five years. I think with every year, it was interesting to see how the audience has been more and more accustomed to the actual hardware of it, to the fact that, oh, what is this? How do I do this? How, where do I kind of, do I feel uncomfortable with the experience that I'm having? It was more about kind of from year three into it, it was more about, oh, actually, oh, okay, I see what this artwork is about. So it was about the art itself rather than the medium, so to speak, which was very, very, um, I think, not rewarding, but inspiring to a certain degree that it's just a matter of, um, the medium itself being embraced and, and it's no longer a novelty in a way. So I think what happened last year, not I guess not necessarily with VR, but just digital art and obviously with the whole NFT blow up, I think it's it's it it it's it's exciting because digital artists, you know, for kind of the first time in a very long time are having their moments now. And hopefully, I mean the again that's something probably we'll we'll discuss later on, but Time and time again, any discussion around um, digital art or specifically NFT is always the curation or the lack of curation, the understanding of the good and the bad NFT out there. And I think that's something that I can relate to the whole VR experiences that we had is at some point there was a curatorial decision that had to be made in terms of are we featuring this artist or this work part of the show because of the quality of this work or the or the intention are we are we evaluating the, the quality of the, the the production of this piece or because it's just a vr um experience and it's exciting but the quality is actually quite it, it, arguable and more importantly will, will the audience care or mind because again it's all a novelty kind of experience it's all about the experience and then i think yeah so 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 i think that that's an interesting the aesthetic element is quite an interesting element to it of of the importance of the aesthetics basically in digital art generally and how far that can that can be supported and and uh, by a collector base a budding collector base but a collector base nonetheless um yeah and i think and i think generally um yeah in terms of the collector base i think it's a growing it's a growing um, market and so long as we're consistent and we've got other galleries, other kind of marketplaces that are that have a physical space and that are supporting this medium, I think that's that's what we need in a way is the kind of the ecosystem to really embrace general kind of digital screen based media as a, 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 you know one of the kind of main mediums out there. Yes, um, and I think also normalize this way of viewing art that it obviously is you know slightly different i remember even last year again during uh, cut off online online 2020 that we did a that we did a talk uh, <clears throat> with someone from uh, an auction house and he was still saying oh you know but i think and i think it's really important to to have that painting on the wall and now i mean sure sort of I guess but this is made me think a little bit um and maybe we can move from from this into nft sort of swiftly nft which again is uh is a way of uh sort of selling sort of digital art are they sort of a complement to traditional art or a competition to traditional art do you think well, one thing I want to say about um, your your point about having the painting on the wall, what I thought was interesting is when Sotheby's did their recent uh, NFT or what's called natively digital sale, is that they still had like a room and they were projecting the things on a wall, right? And you well, you, <laughs> you, you, you might wonder why, right? Isn't that like against the idea of why not have it all online and purely digital? Why have hardware projecting the thing on a white wall? I thought that was quite interesting, right? I think it sort of shows how even auction houses are still somewhere in that tension between shouldn't we put it in the, like a big room in a nice projector on a right on a on a bright white wall, um, or can we just sell it online and purely digital as maybe it's meant to go? Uh, uh, yes, but there is nothing against. Uh, I would say once you own a. You know a piece of digital art you can project it and yes you can you can see it but you don't hold it you don't feel it you don't you don't you don't touch it you just it's just a, a visual sort of effect 
no you're you're right i no i i actually hadn't thought about that i i thought actually it was um it was fairly um smart actually to to have these artworks in the room sort of projected on screens or on 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 walls i didn't really think that there was anything against the idea of actually these are online files and they should only live online um but yeah but again it's for me it's interesting to to see and i don't know if anyone wants to add this or christine to see and it's it's actually um fascinating to still be working with very traditional medium in and in, in the market. So seeing a lot of this great physical artworks it being sold, but then also witnessing, you know, what is happening on a completely different level. And I wonder if these two can actually, because now it's all new and there are definitely a lot of challenges, even technical challenges. Um, there are a lot of unknowns as, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, but I wonder if really these two souls these two types of marketing can coexist and can continue to exist and grow alongside each other sort of in the future so that was my well, oh, it to, is me, to me i really don't see nft as a competition to the art market you know to me the, the art market is made of many many different segments that answer to many many different tastes and types of collectors and i see the nfts as the perfect product for uh, the, the category of collectors who are, you could call them the, the crypto uh, investors, people who have made wealth in the crypto technology and are very interested in that space and understand that space. And the NFT is the perfect product for them. And, you know, in the same way as I think auction houses are very good at uh, identifying and targeting new segments of collectors and then making sure that they have and they're selling uh, and offering uh, art that fits their needs. You know, in the same way as we saw historically, the whole category for Russian art grow. It started very slow and then it grew to uh, some uh, extreme numbers. And then, you know, today Russian art, I mean, the Russian art sale in London happened just uh, at the beginning of this week. And uh, they were absolutely not the scale of what they used to be. And, you know, there are reasons for that. And I, I think, this was one segment and the NFT is just another segment. And I think it can completely coexist with the rest of the market. It doesn't mean every art collector is going to jump on NFTs. It's just some people, it's the perfect product for some people. And, and that's great. And that brings excitement. And, and I think that's exactly what was missing a little bit to the market in the years before the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, exactly. No, I agree. And, yes. and I think it's great news for, for, the, for the art market. No, I, yeah. I agree that, uh, I mean, they can definitely coexist, right? I don't think there's, an, I mean, I, I do think that that segmentation is potentially a bit dangerous, right? It, I mean, if, and, and I think that's where maybe this segmentation of art buyers becomes important, right? To the extent that these NFTs are mainly bought by crypto enthusiasts or crypt, people who made money in the crypto market. Or in, I mean, that, that, that you, you have to wonder about how, how how stable this will be, right? How I mean, because then it will be inherently linked to the stability and the price movements in, in certain other markets, right? Which is maybe similar to what has happened in the past, where hedge fund managers were buying certain types of art, and then when hedge funds went belly up, then those types of art also struggled, or when the Japanese were buying main precious and modern art, and they, so so there are some analogies, but I think that it's important to 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 be aware of that, right? And I think the danger now is that maybe the, the buyer base, at least at the very top of this, um, let's say the NFT market, is maybe still pre pretty thin, right? It's a bunch of people that, right? So the seller of the the seller of one of the crypto punks then buys the McCoy. I mean, there's there's like a a very thin base of of, of buyers, yeah, uh, potentially, and 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 that's I mean. That that's potentially a danger for, for the future of the market, I think. Well, I think, I mean, Christoph, I, I agree with you. It's, it, it is challenging, but I think it's, it's very similar to many other segments of the market. Uh, in that way, I think it's, you know, the NFT segment is, doesn't differ from other segments. Um, the good news with the NFT is that there is opportunity for, for growth because now it's through online, it's the social media, and hopefully it will increase. 
Uh, but it's no, true that at this time, I mean, we, we've been tracking, for example, the, the secondary trading of the PAC cell. And mm. I can tell you that the majority of the trades that mm. have been happening since uh, the NFTs have been uh, minted, the majority of the trade is through a minority of collectors. Uh, so th it is definitely driven yes. by... So, so there's definitely growth for the market. But one thing I'm, I'm worried about is that um, people look at the higher, highest prices, right? The record prices. And that the 69 million for the people or the 7 or 9 million for the crypto punk. I mean... There's a, there's a worry that this may may not be repeated soon and, and that this will scare off a lot of people, right? Well, of course, these are exceptions in, in the NFT market today, right? So in a way, the market is starting off at a very high level, right? So it, it's, it's starting from, from prices that are already sort of hard to beat. Um, so and <laughs> I think it's going to be interesting, right? So uh, yes. to, see, to see how this develops over the, over the next few years. But but in a way that also the auction house have it in that, in that sense played their part by having these first NFT sales already marketing them as like, oh, this is the most important NFT ever to come to the market. These are, this is like, they're already marketing it as if it was the new Da Vinci, right? I mean, well, <laughs> almost. Right, no, but um, okay, yes. Uh, quite a few things came to mind, thank you. I wanted to actually ask you, Christine, how you're tracking these sales, but you can answer that in a second, because for me, again, this is a super interesting. I personally love um, crypto banks and I, <laughs> and we not all bumped that in 2017 when they came out, we didn't get one that which, you know, we're being given out for free anyway. So I think uh, it's the crypto banks, especially or specifically anyway, in the, in the history of NFT art, they are quite, historical in a way so i guess that maybe it justifies sort of the price but when i um approached the nft market last year and got to know some artists some players in the market i was a little bit overwhelmed there is a lot of art out there there's a lot of artists there's a lot of talent it's very difficult to uh, sift through it even if um I said to my mom, I said, mom, I think you have to invest. You have to buy something. I'll, you know, I'll help you. And she, she's still asking me, so what are we buying? And I said, uh, I haven't decided yet. Hang on, because there is so much choice out there. And, and I wonder then when the, the auction houses entered this market, again, they sort of gave that kind of a step of approval on certain NFT artists. And I don't know. It seems like, you know, what do you think about that? Do we really need the auction houses to, you know, help push this market through. Otherwise, we would not have had. Even though, and and I and, I, and I'm sure Mila also can um, agree to that. There was a market there before. There was trading happening on, you know, the blockchain or the various other marketplaces. So it's not like NFT was suddenly, or well, the market of NFT was suddenly born with the people sale. It's just that everyone else now in the world is aware of that. So for me, that is really was the key role of auction houses, which also kind of operated as a primary market because they were selling directly from the artist. So yeah, so that was the interesting, um, Thanks for so, that. Yeah, so just quickly, it's interesting because with um, with the Sotheby specifically, I think um, CryptoPunk versus, I th it was a Simon Denny work who obviously, you know, is a name within this whole field from the art, from the arts perspective, right? Rather than the kind of crypto community or, you know, a perfect example of an artist who's kind of treading both communities with great respect. His price was, I think, one of the lowest that was achieved. So in terms of, I think, with what the, the findings of what is working as well in through these sales that are that are being put together, you know, again, super well curated or not, because again, curation has, you know, come up as arguable kind of content wise you know exactly what has been selected to be featured in these sales not Sotheby's specifically Christie's as well um 
the, 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 I think what's interesting to see is what actually is being sold at these high kind of tag kind of prices. But at the, at the end of the day, what is making the headlines is I think, again, paves the way to the thousands of artists that you're saying who have been possibly doing this for, for, for much longer than Beeple has, you know, or, but of course they're not, I mean, again, you, you have, because we've since, because of what we see, what we've been kind of um, involved in in the past five years, when we've only started getting into NFTs, I think from March this year, and what was for us, there was all of a sudden a whole pool of artists that we've been working with in the past who were approaching us saying, great, we're ready to do NFTs, help us, you know, which platforms, which marketplaces are we going to use, which work, how does it work, will it be a GIF, will it be an MP4? And it's just all these questions that, again, and you ask the marketplaces themselves what actually works, and they're like, try it out, see what it works, you know, see what would, what, what, what. so it's, there's a lot of, I think, trial and error on every single level, whether it's from the artist side, from the kind of gallery slash marketplace side that are trying to figure out exactly how can an artist sustain their practice within this kind of field, um, you know, over, over a period of time, minus these whole kind of auctions, which I think is slightly warped it's a parallel universe it doesn't mean you know and again going going back to kind of what what works what what doesn't we you know the few drops that we made on OpenSea, which was kind of the most uh accessible for us platform in terms of just kind of the back end and it just was the easiest one that we kind of um could 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 get into um we started seeing again the number of, of 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 artworks out there, which quality wise again it's disputed, right? It's a, there, there there is good, there is bad, there is horrible, and 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 everything in between. Um, most of it doesn't get sold, and most of it, whether it's being placed for a period of time as an auction or it's just there for sale, you you see some great content which isn't just getting any traction whatsoever possibly one or two likes so it's kind of like it does put into going back to what christine was saying as far as the secondary market being supported by only a few it it does go back to 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 the i think um what's happening now that yes it, it obviously the you know it, it's a mainstream thing everyone are aware of it everyone is super excited about it but I think, and that's where again, going back to aesthetics and the quality, I think what would write off this hype, which is essentially this everything is, in a year, two years, three years down the line, I think those artists that would really kind of ride this wave, not necessarily, you know, reaching their their, their multi-million kind of price tags at auctions, but are managing to 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 sell at a consistent level on various platforms. These are the artists that would be interesting to to look for, to look out for, and and again, you know, parallel drawn to contemporary market. The the, the the number of contemporary artists out there who haven't had the light of day. You know, no galleries, no fairs, no auction houses have any time for them, right? So yes. it's kind of. I think I think what would be interesting to see in the next few years is the structure. So auction houses are getting in great. Marketplaces are there that are replacing galleries and interesting to see how the galleries would be entering that 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 whole space as well with you know all kinds of Koenig galleries and all the rest of them be building their digital spaces in the central land would that be sustainable or that would be more of like pop-ups kind of in digital spaces that's interesting to see as well and then I guess it's just basically almost kind of a parallel universe that's being built to our existing traditional art world which is quite exciting I think as a development but whether it replaces as a traditional i don't think it will right it's just something that that would just be kind of a reflection of our time today as like a parallel again a parallel universe right that exists with its own kind of structures that replace in a way our, our, our physical ones yeah I, I really agree with you mila and you know all this reminds me so much of what happened at the end of the 90s when uh, when uh, artists started to go online i mean uh, at that time this is when I started Direct.com in New York. And, uh, you know, initially we, we couldn't convince artists to go online because they were afraid to do anything outside of the art world. And then within a few years, we had more artists than we couldn't even publish. And, you know, we had more than 500 contemporary artists and they were all, it was very, very similar to that. 
Uh, and, and that was the first online step. At the time, it seemed like impossible. And then within a few years, the, the auction houses embraced it. And uh, well, it took more than a few years. But uh, yeah. a little bit the, the, the same here, because at the time, I remember there was a, a lot of hopes of a new democratization and a new way of doing business and we could cut the intermediaries and everything. But in the end, I think, you know, the, I mean, one thing I've learned over the years is that you should definitely not underestimate the role of the, the curator, the role of the galleries, the role of the dealers. And, and not only because they, they add a lot of value, but also because a lot of collectors need that reinsurance. They need the information, they need the, uh, all the this value added that uh, that is brought by the the, the the structure of the art market is there for a reason. So I could see for the NFT, as you said, Mila, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of offering right now. So much that as as uh, you you told us very clearly, uh, Julia, your mother got lost, and it's very difficult to find your way. And obviously, you need somebody who understands this market to guide you and and advise you. And a lot of people want that. Yeah. Yes. I would also oh. like, I mean, I think Mila said something interesting about quality and aesthetics. And uh, I think what, what is really interesting about the current offering, especially at auction houses, it's not so clear whether it's art, right? Or whether people are paying it for the art. Think about the crypto punks. I mean, people are paying, I think, for the fact that these were one of the first and it's a technological innovation and, and, and there's a community that, that has been built around it. But are they really paying for the, I mean, is it art? I mean, I'm, I, I don't know, right? And maybe it, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Christie's and Stoltebees also sell other types of collectibles. So maybe it doesn't have to be art to be sold at Christie's or Stoltebees. Um, didn't they sell a dinosaur recently also in one of their art auctions? So, I mean, it doesn't have to be art to sell in an art auction. But I, I do think that um, if you think about, okay, what is driving the prices? Like, why, is, why are crypto punk, punk selling for so much? I don't think it's for the artistic qualities. Eh? I think it's for the fact that this is a conceptual sort of a proof of concept and sort of one of the first and, 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 and it's part of people's identity maybe. If I mean, not part of my identity, but, but some people's identity. Okay. And I think that explains also the prices, right? And, and um, I think you could also see it in, in the way that, for example, Sotheby's was, was trying to sell or describing some of these works. They were, they were using a very different language for pieces that were sold more on their artistic merits and compared to, for example, the crypto punks, which were sold more on their crypto technological merits, right? And I think that's that conflation sometimes makes it hard. I think for people to understand sort of prices, right? So, so why is this selling for so much? And then people look at a crypto punk, and then I sometimes try to explain this to my colleagues, right? I'm working in a finance department in a business school. And I try to explain them that this set of pixels is selling for so much money, and they're like, okay, but but why? <laughs> and, and, and I often come back to more sort of the technological points and then sort of the, the conceptual innovations rather than the artistic merit, which I think is fine, right? I mean, I think it's nice that people pay a lot of money for, for something that was innovative. Um, but, but crypto punks are not necessarily like... But, but Christoph, if I may add to that, I think in the days of uh, the rise of stocks like GameStop or AMC, I think it's clear that the value is not necessarily in the product. I mean, there's also the whole social media aspect. The fact no, that people talk about that's... it, get about it, beat about it, and so, no, and no, that's definitely agenda. true. I mean, there's, there's an argument made. I mean, I, it's not my point. It's uh, uh, um, um, I think Matt Levine, who's a columnist, who said like a lot of the people who buy GameStop and um, or GameStop and, uh, and 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 some of these Dodge coins and and other some of these hypes. They probably know it's ridiculous, but they're still happy to do it because sort of you're part of the community, you're part of a joke, right? You're, it's a joke, but you know it's a joke and you're happy to be part of a joke. And I, I mean, I, I think it, to some extent that may also be going, going on in some corners of the NFT market that people are like, well, I know it's silly to spend a million on a set of pixels that shows up a, a, a punk avatar, but I'm happy to do that because it gives me a lot of utility, right? I mean, and as long as it, I mean, people should pay for whatever makes them happy, right? And if that's what makes you happy, there's nothing irrational about it necessarily. But it does make it a bit hard to explain sometimes, I think. And and um, and it, it does mean that prices. I mean, you should you should not necessarily. I think it, uh, different from the old masters market, you should not necessarily see prices as being super highly correlated with 
any measure of artistic quality or aesthetic skill or I, don't, I mean I, or I mean it, it, it just it's a it's a it's a function of many different things that makes people happy right and I, I think yeah. that's important to understand yes although Christoph can I I would love to be a fly on the wall when you try to explain to your colleagues about the crypto pants I would really like that um, well the crypto pants stuff but then there was a single gray pixel by was it Pac? I don't know uh, oh yeah, yeah it was Pac, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, wow. Well, I mean, the crypto <laughs> punks I could still manage, but some of the other things uh, is like, okay, well, then I say like it's the Eve Klein, right? Eve Klein also had these uh, blue paintings. So, yeah, but I think the fungible, pixel. the fungible, non fungible token was quite, uh, quite an interesting concept. Yes. But I mean, I think, uh, and so yes, in, in theory, as you mentioned, like all masters uh, should be the you know most valuable paintings out there. But we see in the market that oftentimes contemporary art is more expensive than old master paintings. No, I'm not saying that old master should be the most expensive paintings, right? But I'm saying within the old masters category, prices line up quite well, probably with some measures of artistic skill, let's say, or or right, right? Mm -hmm. within the old masters. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think you, you cannot really compare uh, old masters to contemporary to NFTs because, and that's related to that discussion that people pay for very different things, right? In, in different types of the segments yeah. of the market. Yes, um, yes. But I think it's it, it, within the NFT market, it, it's really hard to say, okay, what is, I mean, there's so many dimensions that are important apart from the aesthetic quality or artistic quality that people have a hard time understanding prices, right? Because it's also about technolo technology and how innovative is something and what's the community like? And yes. is there yes. a high, is there a discussion on social media or not? And things like that. So. Yeah, now it's all part of this kind of a new market emerging. And um, I think we're gonna wrap up now. It's, we're coming up to 4 p.m. So uh, Christine, maybe when we have a, let me find it when I sort of I join your talks. I'll, I'll ask you how you you track this uh, these results. But I wanted to thank you all for your thoughts and contribution. I think this for me is really interesting. I'm actually really excited to see how the market will evolve. I think we all agree that it's a pretty exciting moment for the art industry in general. And hopefully we can leverage this new uh, excitement, the new energy in the market and continue to grow. And for the NFT market per se, I would really love it to, as Mila said, if we could move to have a bit more structure to, for it to become more sort of mature market as well. Not right away, but now it does feel a, a little bit still unknown or with, with a lot of sort of question marks and that that would be really my hope and um, as kind of a professional in in the art industry you know I would love to to be part of that um, kind of evolution of of the NFT market towards a sort of bit more structure so and uh, development of the collector's base and relationship as you said Christine also I think that is quite key for any a player in the art industry to have that relationship with collectors and, and, and clients, yes. Yeah, and, and to me, you know, what really fascinates me with the, the NFT market is, is the fact that you have a secondary training. I mean, in the art market, that's one of the things that is difficult. The, the art sells at, sells at auction, and then it takes years before it comes back. So it's very difficult to get an understanding exactly of where it's going. With an NFT, it, trade, it basically can trade 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what was really fascinating with the, the collection of PAC, that Sotheby's auction, is that there are these fungible, non-fungible NFTs. So almost every day, there's one of these cubes that trades. And it gives such interesting data to look at pricing, to look at what influenced the trading, how many are traded every day. What's the impact of Ether, the cryptocurrency, on this trading? Uh, how many people are trading? I mean, and, and so and so. So it's such a mine of data that is so fascinating. I think Christoph, next paper, NFT trading. I, there you go, an idea just there. I might be working on something, but uh, 
<laughs> okay, good. I have to. I mean, like, uh... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was thinking that. Actually. No, but it's true that the data, I mean, it, it's, it, the data in aspect is interesting, right? Because there's so much data out there. You could see that, of course, uh, academics take an interest, but also practitioners um, start writing research in different formats. Because, I mean, many of these platforms have data that are quite easy to, to collect and to analyze. So I think that, that it, it does create a, a sort of transparency that uh, you don't always have in other corners of the market. Yes. Well, we'll be waiting for your paper. I'll be waiting for your paper, so. I hope the hype is not over by the time the paper is oh, out. Doesn't... I'm sure not. I'm sure not. But thank you. Thank you all um, for... A again uh, your participation and uh, I hope that we will see each other again in person soon but if not on another panel anyway thank you so much thank you thank you Julia. bye bye thank you bye everyone <laughs>